we just finished talking about Myers-Briggs and about how personality types may not reflect what's going on in science. Instead, we're looking for personality traits that follow a normal curve or a distribution. And one of the first researchers to look at personality traits was Hans Eisnick. And he tried to really look at this through a scientific lens, through looking at the biology and how biology may be tied to personality. And through doing this, he considered three major traits of personality, not types. What's really important here is one person could be considered to be high, low, or medium in all three of these traits at the same time. That is, you could be high or low in extroversion, neuroticism, or psychoticism all at the same time, or you could be high in one, low in two, or an infinite combination. So rather than looking at types, now we're looking at traits. So what are these biologically based traits? Well, Eisnick believed that extroversion introversion was connected with our level of arousal. We talked about this with Hebb's theory of arousal in unit 10, but this is the idea that extroverts actually get less cortisol or less arousal through their blood brain barrier, and it makes them more sleepy and understimulated versus introverts get more arousal through their blood brain barrier and makes them overstimulated. And so someone who's more extroverted, they get that lower level of arousal, which actually makes them seek out more stimulation. It makes them more talkative, it makes them more social, they have more energy, and they tend to be more assertive. In comparison, someone who's more introverted is more inhibited and more easily overstimulated. Eisnick also believed in this trait of neuroticism, and this is how prone to stress or anxiety a person was. It was different than introversion. Introversion just wanted to be alone, but maybe calm. Versus neuroticism was about negative emotions. People high in neuroticism would be people that were stressed out, that were sad, that were fearful. They're also maybe more prone to anger. They're just going to be more emotionally reactive. Versus someone who's lower in neuroticism would be more calm, cool, and collected. And finally, the third trait, according to Eisnick, was psychoticism. And psychoticism had to do with testosterone. And he believed people higher in testosterone would be more aggressive, they'd be more risk-taking, they'd be more manipulative. And what's really interesting is he believed people higher in psychoticism would be more creative. Think about a serial killer with very creative techniques. And so psychoticism was considered to be something very bad, but we could also have someone who's very low in psychoticism who's very gentle and sweet and very open and authentic. So Eisnick's work helped us to start talking about these traits, but it's important to understand a lot of Eisnick's work has been discredited, particularly some of his work trying to connect personality to cancer research. And so we like to leave Eisnick in the past. Another researcher we're going to talk about is Raymond Cattell. And Raymond Cattell really wanted to bring science to personality research. Some of the very astounding things that Raymond Cattell did was taking a lexical approach to personality research. In this, he looked at dictionaries to look at the human lexicon of how we describe other people. It had to be things that we could describe in sort of a personality-like way. And his work led to the finding of about 20,000 words just in the English lexicon that could be used to describe personality. Now, do we have 20,000 different personality traits? That would be overwhelming. Instead, then he took the statistical approach where he statistically clustered and looked at how those different words clustered into groups. He gave people personality questionnaires and seen how their scores on some answers clustered with their scores on other answers. And based on this, Cattell identified 16 factors of personality or 16 different personality traits. Again, these are not types, they are traits. So we wouldn't find ourselves in only one of these blocks. We would have a score for all 16 of these blocks, and it could be high, low, medium, anywhere in between. Using these 16 dimensions of personality traits, Cattell believed we could better articulate what made every individual unique. However, later researchers started to look at this and started to say, look, some of these 16 factors seem sort of redundant. Someone who's trusting and warm might be someone who's low in aggression. Someone who's high in intellect might also be high in abstractness and might be low in conventionality. Someone who's high in dutifulness might also be high in perfection. Someone who's high in emotional stability is probably low in sensitivity, apprehension, and tension. And someone who's high in liveliness and assertiveness might be low in introversion. So later researchers and lots of different research teams looked at the work by Cattell and looked at his questionnaires and by running the numbers in a very similar way, but through allowing these 16 factors to overlap, they discovered the big five factors of personality. And there's lots of researchers that can be connected to the big five factor model, and particularly McCray and Costa are two that are commonly cited. 
But the big five-factor model of personality was discovered in the late 1980s, 1990s, and it's been the most popular scientifically backed version of personality since that time. So the majority of my lifetime, the big five-factor model personality has been the model that psychologists have gone to to analyze our personality. So what is the big five-factor model personality? Well, it's really the idea that we have five traits that again, we could have any level of them. They're more like sliding bars. They're not types. And they are extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness. Let's dive a little bit deeper into them and see what they're all about. So when we talk about extroversion and introversion, you're probably very familiar what we mean by these words at this point, but someone who's high in extroversion is considered to be more social, more talkative, more assertive, they tend to be more leader-like, they're more forward and bold, and yeah, they can be loud. Versus someone who's low in extroversion is considered to be an introvert. And introversion is associated with someone who's a bit more cautious, more shy, more bashful, quiet, inhibited, and someone who's a loner. Now, notably, 70% of us are in the middle on this spectrum. And so if you're trying to determine where you are, you're probably average on extroversion introversion, and that's pretty typical. But if you are an extreme extrovert, we tend to find your battery gets refilled when you're around others. Versus if you're an extreme introvert, your battery gets refilled when you're alone. The second trait is the trait of agreeableness versus disagreeableness. So someone who's considered to be high in agreeableness, they're really warm and kind, cooperative, gentle, sincere, and sympathetic. This is different from being an extrovert. An extrovert might have lots of friends and lots of contacts versus someone who's high in agreeableness might have fewer friends, but those friendships are much more intimate, much more intense. Versus someone who's low in agreeableness or high in disagreeableness is someone who's a bit more harsh or jealous, they're more cruel, competitive, a bit more self-centered or egocentric, and a bit more cynical. They're not necessarily psychopathic or mean, but they're more about themselves first. So someone who is high in disagreeableness is going to put themselves first, versus someone who's more high in agreeableness will put others in their relationships first. Though keep in mind, again, 70% of us are going to be average on this spectrum as well. The third factor to come out of the big five model is conscientiousness versus casualness. And so a person who's considered to be really high in conscientiousness, they're well organized, they're detailed, they're responsible, neat, punctual and on time, and they're meticulous. They're the people that are really focused on the details. Versus someone who's low in conscientiousness or a bit more casual, they're a bit more careless. They're a bit more unfocused, disorganized. They can be sloppy and unreliable, but they're also the big picture thinkers. What's really important is you can be a successful person who's very casual. You're just going to be a person who your notes are out of order, your desk is a bit sloppy, and you're not really sticking to the details. So it might be harder for you to proofread things, but you might have really good ideas at the big picture level. Again, the majority of us are going to be average on this trait. The fourth one, we've seen this term used before with Eisnick, and that is neuroticism. So we call this spectrum emotional stability versus neuroticism. Someone who's more towards the emotional stable end of things, they're going to be more calm, more confident, composed. They're more relaxed and content. When things happen, they're less jumpy. They're more able to regulate their emotions. Versus someone who is more neurotic, well, they're going to be more tense. They're more excitable. They're more reactive to their environment. Because of this, they're more anxious, more moody. They're more impulsive, and they are more insecure. They just have stronger feelings, or their feelings dominate them a bit more. Again, majority of us are in the middle on this, but if someone is extremely neurotic, they're really being led more by their feelings, and they might have a hard time coping with a lot of their really potent feelings. We know that in the university, a lot of students are pretty high on neuroticism because we spend a lot of time preoccupied and worried about grades and worried about all the details. You can imagine someone who's high in both conscientiousness and neuroticism might be that really panicky, perfectionistic person versus someone who's really casual and emotionally stable. They might be really calm, cool, collected, and easygoing about being relaxed. And finally, the fifth factor in the big five factors is what is called open versus closed or open to experience versus closed. And this is definitely the hardest factor to describe. This one's the only one that's received a lot of criticism because it seems to be a couple different factors blended in. But someone who's high in openness is considered to be someone who's really creative. They can think outside the box. They're a bit of a dreamer. And they tend to be able to take the perspectives of other people, which makes them more tolerant and more progressive, and they're more imaginative. They also might be more intellectual in terms of processing new information and finding new ways of thinking. 
Whereas people that are low in openness or more closed, they tend to be more conventional, traditional thinkers. They tend to think in a more boxed in sort of way and a bit more predictable way. Because of this, they've sometimes been described as more narrow-minded, more conservative, or in some instances, more dull. One of my favorite questions on a big five-factor measure that I like to think about is, would you eat something very new and very unusual? And someone who's high in openness, they're open to these new experiences, they're like, yeah, I'll go eat something very unusual, versus someone who's very closed might not want to go eat something very unusual. And that's one of the ways that we can kind of see it, more progressive versus more conventional. This tends to get confused with political axes. It's important to understand that there are people who vote for very progressive political parties who are very closed minded and very narrow minded. And there's also people who vote for very conservative political parties who are very creative and imaginative and actually progressive despite the way they politically lean. And so this cannot be used synonymously. Though we do tend to find some liberals tend to be more open minded and some conservatives tend to be more conventional, it's not a hard fast rule. And so the big five factor has been the biggest model of personality in my lifespan and remains one of the most well-cited and one of the most statistically and scientifically supported theories of personality. That being said, there's two that have emerged since the big five factor that are quickly picking up steam and picking up popularity in personality research. We'll talk about those next.